Sorry, no, it's not actually a question about Hadoop. It's about um, high-performance computing and grids. So uh, we're, we're struggling with a lot of the same problems you are. I work in a bank, and our, our largest grid is actually 5,500 blades, so around 30,000 cores. And we have the same problems. How do you maintain the code base? How do you cope with an ever-increasing volume of data? And also, how do you find the coding skills? And I think you talked a lot about trying to find people who can program both in massively parallel programs and massively multi-threaded. Have you thought about virtualizing the whole environment so that everything looks like a single core or a dual core machine? And then you don't have to worry about so much of the parallelization as well as the virtualize as well as the multi-threading. And the other question I had was you said that grid is very much a technology of eight or nine years ago. And again, we're looking at a lot of the platforms like the data synapses and platform itself, which has just been bought by IBM and Condor, which is the open source version. And what we're finding is that you can then code to the grid engine and you don't have to worry quite so much about the underlying hardware. Is that something you're investigating? <coughs> so I'd, I'd say for, for, for both of those, there's a, there's a benefit to, to, to getting to a homogeneous environment. So, so, so an advantage of going to VMware and making everything a similar size node would be you've, you've got a homogeneous environment. It's very easy to manage your, your images. It's very easy to move processes around. And in a full vSphere environment, there are lots of ways of bringing up and shutting down processes, which are quite useful. But of course, in, in a high-performance computing problem, what you, what you typically want is as much of the memory as possible. You know, if you, you, want, you, want to, you, you want to slice up your resources as little as possible, not as much as possible. So you're, you're kind of driven, in, in high-performance computing, you're often driven away from lots of fine-grained problems to clusters of slightly larger problems to, to get performance. <coughs> and so ideally, yes, you, you, you'd like to have a, a flat computing environment where, where everything's identical and it's easy to manage. But in, in practice, you, 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 you typically need to be squeezing the performance out of your, um, your I.O. bandwidth. You need to be squeezing performance out of your network card. You need to be squeezing performance out of your memory buses. And in those environments, we find that slicing up a blade into three or four different um, isn't what our users want to do. In fact, if, if anything, what they often want to do is grab a whole node and take all the memory for that node for a single threaded process. And, and that's a problem, but we have to give them the flexibility to do that until all of their code is, is fine-grained enough. Um, as for coding against a grid environment, I, th I think in the end, we will all be coding against some sort of distributed framework. The grid frameworks were good, not, not ideal at mapping data locality onto processor locality, which is a problem for, for us in, in a more heterogeneous environment. But certainly, I would imagine in, in, in five, ten years' time, I don't imagine that anyone will be writing individual MPI codes. I think anyone who's got any sense will be, will be writing their codes against some sort of framework, whether that's you, you know a Condor framework or, or you know, something something based on Hadoop and MapReduce and, and, and the rest. I think most of the big codes will be written against frameworks. And, and in fact, what we should be watching out for are those frameworks. What, where are they coming from? Have we got the right ones? Have we got everything that we need? Great. Uh, th th there's a hand right at the back there. It's a good job when we have microphones, because you'd really have to show. Oh, it's all right. I'm good at shouting. Oh, dear. Uh, just to touch on uh, uh, what the guy from the bank was talking about uh, and also what I was going to ask anyway. Um, uh, basically, uh, I don't know if I, uh, who remembers OpenMP when it was all new and stuff. Um, it was easy to write uh, a code that parallelized reasonably well with OpenMP, uh, but its performance as compared to a, an MPI code was, was rubbish, basically. And it took just as long to optimize it to work well, uh, uh, involving rewriting your code, uh, as it did to write an MPI code in the first place. And the performance still wasn't quite as good. And th that's what I was going to ask. I mean, uh, I run a, uh, a similar 
sized uh, uh, resource uh, to you. Um, and I'm finding it increasingly difficult. I mean, people have been talking about it all day. It's all about ecosystem. Uh, and I've found it um, increasingly difficult um, to find the kit that I want because I've, uh, I think the, the ecosystem is, is, it's all about cots now and everything's born down and we're riding on the coattails of, uh, uh, of, of technologies that weren't designed for high performance computing. Um, uh, so we ride on the coattails of gaming a lot. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I used to work for a company called Quadrix that made it an interconnect. Uh, and uh, there were several about at that time. Of course, there was uh, Mirinet. Uh, IB was just starting to come out. Uh, there was QSNet. Uh, and there, there, were, there were various technologies, and all of these seem to be shrinking down. So if you want a low latency in, interconnect, it's IB. Uh, if, and yes, there are multiple vendors, but uh, Cisco shut one down, and, and it's... Uh, there just isn't the choice there anymore. Is is that something you're finding in in your environment? I, it's it's certainly the case that diversity has has kind of gone out of the environment, um, and everything is driven by commodity. Um, in some ways, that's a shame. We've we've lost a lot of architectures. It's probably harder to program in a commodity environment because you're making more compromises. On the other hand, we have to save money. We have to build clusters cheaply. It's brilliant to be able to go out to a standard vendor who's selling into banks, who's selling into the big data centers in the states and say, just how cheap is a processor? Just how many millions of chips are being produced? Just how standardized are our interconnects? And it, it's, it's a shame to lose the diversity and I think it's important to sustain that because that's where the development comes from. But it's great for us, you know, if you want to build a 2000 core cluster, you can go out and you can buy it from, you can have Dell and IBM and HP compete against each other on price. That's that's been a benefit. Um, the downside is, yes, you have to cobble together your system out of commodity parts, and then you have to program for it. And no, there isn't a straightforward way to generate optimized code. Um, you still have to hit the books, scratch your head, optimize your code, and, and that's a problem. Yeah, Martha. Well, the, the only thing to say in addition to that, of course, the diversity is a two-edged sword, as I was trying to bring out as well, because diversity is good if it provides you with genuine choice. Diversity is bad when it either causes complete stalemate because you don't know which way to jump because they are mutually incompatible. So I think a real key is around the where the interconnects are. <coughs> and one of the things that I haven't really seen much of yet, but I but I have seen it in, in, in particular industries. If you think some time back when it, the, the big thing was, okay, if we can just have protocols for industries and then we can automate processes from end to end. The only industry that ever men, made it was the electronics industry with RosettaNet. The rest of the industry continues to work with multiple standards. But what's emerging now for commerce is, I, I loosely term it translation hub, but then I would with my background, is almost brokers that can convert whatever to whatever. <laughs> and that is, I think, the one development that I haven't really seen in this current ecosystem. And that is to say, well, you may well find that certain things, it never makes sense to you know, provide a native connector from this to that. And as long as it doesn't have to be you know, ultra low latency, when, in which case, of course, you don't want a converter in there. But having, having that kind of interface broker, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> That's something I'm not seeing at the moment because that would help you preserve some of that diversity you've, you've lost. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions? Oh, there's a couple down the front here. Uh, maybe you first. Um, hi. I was interested in your comments about Hadoop and uh, not being necessarily suitable for low latency and transactional uh, systems. Um, I was wondering what are the trends on the transactional side? Are there any sort of big players in the open source industry? At the moment, they're not. I think where the discussion, and that's my impression, obviously. Uh, my impression is that this discussion at the moment is uh, by those mainly that are looking at the price points and that are saying, hang on a minute, I can really do one hell of a lot here and I can do it quite cheaply. <laughs> but 
whether that calculation would still stack up when you're trying to go transactional because then you have to have a completely different attitude towards um, you know, single points of failure, overall failure rates, throughput rates, reliability and all of that. And as we all know, that tends to do nasty things to your price point. So I think on that one, the jury is out. <laughs> Peter, do you want to add to that? Could you ask the question again? Um, it was sort of around um, transactional mm -hmm. systems, low latency, and I imagine that you know it's important for you to be storing the result sets and recovering from failures and that side of things. Uh, <clears throat> so, so what we do for our transactional systems, we um, um, we we use fiber channel. It's relatively straightforward now to get a, a MySQL database to scale up to to two terabytes, for example. We we see that quite routinely. We don't have to. We don't have to put things into the database transactionally, um, so, so we're not so driven by, by latency at, at, at that end. We need to read out of it, um, so, so that technology seems to work. Most of our data is actually flat file, so, so the, the big, big data systems, you know, the 100 terabyte data sets, um, they're, they're not going into relational databases at all. Lovely, and we'll have to make this one the last I'm quite hungry, I don't know about you guys. Mm -hmm. Sorry, anyway, yes, Just your question <laughs> first. Though. Don't, don't feel pressured, sure that's question. all I'm saying. Yeah. Is, uh, is to what extent is OpenCL being adopted in, in, in the kind of uh, high-performance computing world you're in? OpenCL? OpenCL. Um, uh, this, this is a framework for programming in a parallel language that gets allocated to, to GPGPU stuff. Oh, right, so, so, so coding down to GPGPU level isn't something that's very widely done in, in the biological sciences because our, our work tends to be mostly, well, well, certainly in genomics, genetics, it's mostly sort of, sort of integer sequence alignment work. So, so the, the chance of squeezing that into a GPGPU is, um, uh, it, it's a bit niche anyway. Um, the question of how we take our old codes, a lot of bioinformatics codes, a lot of systems biology codes are um, 10 or 15 years old, but the question of taking them apart and recoding the core algorithms so we can make use of GP GPUs is an interesting one because no one in our field is actually paid to do that work. They're paid to publish research results. So to, to take apart an old piece of code and rewrite it so it's a bit faster is, um, is an interesting question, how we'll convince people to even put that effort in. So, so I'd say in our field, no, I mean, this is one of the issues. Taking apart an old code and recoding it against those basic libraries isn't something that people are doing wholesale yet. They will have to if it's the only way you can program the next generation of chips. But, you know, that depends on a little bit of technology foresight if, if things really do go this way. Mm. Martha, do you want to add to that? Very quickly, uh, GPU computing is one of those areas where there is a lot more promise at the moment than actually re reality. It's a while since I looked at it in detail, and I know NVIDIA has recently made a lot of changes as well on how they position it. But I do know from working with a bank on an early GPU project, uh, it was enormous effort and in the end ended up being suitable for more or less just one thing, which it did very well, and it was worth the effort. It's around, for, for those of you in the industry, around Monte Carlo simulation which you know, requires something very specific that a GPU was very well suited to. So once you'd gone to that effort of redoing your entire code, it was worth it. But the bank that deployed that also hasn't done anything else with it since. <laughs> with, with GPU, I mean. Obviously, those simulations are running very happily. But so yeah, I, no, Peter doesn't have anyone to do that work. So if you're volunteering, this is, it's really Hello. good that we've got you together. It's just one more great thing that we've done for you today. Um, I just, so just to, uh, we, we, uh, we have to break, say have to break for lunch. We need to break for lunch in case your blood sugar falls to falls dangerously low levels and yeah, you fall off the stools. Um, so as you know, as, as you recall, uh, as in, very interesting presentation from Peter talking not just about how you have to rewrite the software, you're actually gonna have to rewrite some of the science. So again, volunteers from the audience, we, we do need to, and um, speaking as someone who, uh, who does make a lot of noise with a very weak signal, I was very interested in Martha's uh, ca uh, um, categorization of uh, big day, this is big day.